Hi everyone, I'm Tatiana with New Beauty and we are at the ASDS conference. We are here talking about hair loss today and we'll be diving into the latest treatments and technologies in the field. We have three leading experts with us here today, Dr. Megan Kuvion, mm -hmm. Dr. Doris Day, and Dr. McKenna Abercrombie. And they're gonna share their insights on what's really working and what's new. Okay, so when patients come in to talk about hair loss, what are the primary causes that you're seeing at your practice? And I love that you asked the question this way because that is really the key when it comes to hair loss is understanding what is the cause or what is the diagnosis. The two most common things that I'm seeing in my practice are what we call telogen effluvium, which is essentially a disruption in the hair cycling caused by a stressor. This can be things like changes in hormonal medication, starting or stopping a birth control. It can be having had an illness like COVID. It can be having had surgery. And we usually see this significant shedding several months after the event. And it can be super, super distressing. Um, the other cause that we see is female and male pattern hair loss. And this is what most people call normal age-related hair loss, that thinning that we see in men, we know the pattern when we see it, the hair will kind of recede back, or we see thinning like on the vertex scalp, the top of the crown of the scalp. In women, it looks a little bit different. We see that gradual thinning, widening of the part. Um, so those are what we see most commonly in our offices and you know others, of course. Wonderful. And Dr. Day, what are the treatments that you're doing the most right now? What treatments are trending at your practice? So we do a lot of different things. We always start with what is FDA approved. So I give my patients a rundown of what their options are. Men have two options. They have oral finasteride and topical minoxidil. But the only FDA approved medicine for women is topical minoxidil. So we start with that because those are the no-brainers for them to start with. And then we have a whole bunch of other things that we could add on. Um, there's supplements. Nutrafol is a very popular one that's out there. My mom calls it the miracle pill. <laughs> She's 90 and has more hair than she did at 70. So for her, it's a good pill. Some patients don't tolerate it as well. So not everything is for everybody. We do PRP in the office as well. We have two different concentrations of PRP. And we have something called the Fatona Hair Lays, which is a laser that works through photobiomodulation to stimulate and wake up the follicles. And we do that before any PRP injections. And sometimes people just do that by themselves. And we have amazing before and afters of how much that stimulates the follicles. And I also think that in most types of hair loss, even in the androgenic types, there is microinflammation at the base of the follicle. So I do very low concentration cortisone injections, even for my androgenetic alopecia patients, along with other treatments. And then we have um, hair restart by calcin, which is helpful. So there's a whole array of things. And then I write out for them what each thing is, how it works, what type of hair loss they have. So they shouldn't feel overwhelmed by so many choices, but they should feel hopeful. And you always want to tell your patients that we fight for every hair on your head. We are here to help grow back as much of your hair as we can. And we have so many tools because there isn't one thing that works for everybody. What about you, Dr. Abercrombie? What is trending at your practice? What are you doing a lot of right now? Absolutely. So something that I have found to be very, very effective, especially for women with that androgenetic or pattern type of hair loss, is oral minoxidil, especially in combination with platelet-rich plasma or PMRP injections. There's been a lot of really impressive studies showing the efficacy of the combination together versus using one separate from the other. Um, so that's something that I found awesome um, improvement of hair thickness and hair density for my patients with, and is something that um, is obviously very exciting to patients because they can see the improvement as we follow up month to month. We were talking about the different causes. Are you seeing a lot of people coming in with hair loss related to weight loss? That's a really good question. I would say probably all of us would, would agree yes, especially with the new medications out there, like the semaglutides and uh, terzepatides. Um, any kind of stressor to the body where it's rap, you know, rapid weight loss, the other causes that she had mentioned before can cause a type of hair loss called telogen effluvium. Um, which we are seeing with these medications due to just the effect that they have on the body and, and that change. So yes, absolutely. May I make another yes. comment about that? So I also think it's really important to understand that it's not the medications that are causing right. weight loss. It's right. the rapidness of the weight loss. And actually in people who are taking these oral GLP-1, GL GIP-1 drugs because they have diabetes and insulin resistance, actually correcting that insulin resistance has other health benefits beyond what you might think of when it comes to treating like diabetes and insulin resistance actually 
patients who have PCOS, for example, they might deal with acne and hair loss. And I've actually seen those patients do better because of treatment. And I would have people love that. And it's absolutely true. And if you control the rate of loss, you don't have that stress shedding in the same way. But I think one thing we overlook a lot is the effects of peri and postmenopause on hair loss. Yeah. And a lot of women, as they enter perimenopause, will have a stress shedding because you have very rapid shifts in hormones. We feel that in our mood, we see it in our skin, and it certainly happens in the hair. So when patients come in in their 40s and they're complaining of what looks to me like telogen effluvium, I always do, I always have a conversation with them about hormone replacement and whether or not they're in perimenopause. And then I refer them to physicians who can manage that for them. But I think it's something that we need to talk about more with our patients. So it sounds like a combination approach seems to be best, but is there one thing that everybody should be doing right now to s sort of stop the, the loss or help with regrowth? It's, it's really diet management, stress management. It's not about not having stress. It's about how you manage your stress. I always say only the end of the world is the end of the world. You know, everything else is a puzzle. We'll get there. You've gotten here in life. You'll, you'll get through this, whatever it is. So it's looking at your stress differently than the way we do and being okay. If you have small children, chaos is normal. Enjoy it. It's going to pass. But it's, it's our mindset around the stress. And then I do think minoxidil is overall a great anti-ager for the hair. And if we look at it not as something you have to do forever or you're going to lose all your hair, but something that you just you apply your moisturizer and antioxidants to your skin, if you use minoxidil, your hair will not just grow, but grow thicker. Same question. Same question for everyone. I think that if there is hair loss going on that is continuing over a period of time, even if it's slow or if it's very rapid, you need to see a dermatologist because while hair types, hair loss types that we've been talking about have been treatable and are non-scarring, we actually do have hair loss types that can cause scarring, which is loss of the follicle. And for those patients, time is hair. And so we don't want to wait until this is 20 years down the road and then we're trying to treat it. We want to treat early so that we can preserve your ability to grow hair. And I think that's really key to understand. There are also, so when I mentioned more rapidly progressive hair loss types, so type of hair loss we have is alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune type of hair loss. For those patients, for the first time ever, we have three FDA approved tr treatment options for patients who have severe alopecia areata. And two years ago, we had none. So wow. for those patients, we really have the ability to make meaningful change for their hair. And it's super, super impactful on day-to-day -day lives. What are those three treatments? So these are oral medications that target the inflammation involved. The trade names are one, the first one on the market was Illumiant, which was FDA approved about two years ago. Then we had Litfilo, which was FDA approved, I believe, in the last year. And then most recently, Lexelvi. So all what, oral meds. And then Dr. Abercrombie, what's one thing that you think everyone should be doing? So I think we've had some awesome points and I agree with all of them. Something um, that I might mention because I don't think we've talked about it yet is just overall good hair care um, and maintenance. So the way we're styling our hair is huge. And we know that using high heat and not protecting our hair with different styling practices really does cause increase in breakage and stress on the hair. Um, in addition, certain chemical processing techniques for straightening or curling like perms can really cause long-term damage and, and severe breakage for hair. So doing things that are gentle, monitoring the heat that is um, being placed on the hair, keeping the temperature around 350 or less using heat protectants, doing heatless styling when possible. All of those things do matter in the long run and will preserve the health of your hair. Is there anything either at the show or happening now in aesthetics that you're looking forward to? What can we expect for the future of hair regrowth? So I think that the idea of regenerative medicine is very interesting and kind of like a hot topic right now. We're hearing about the use of exosomes, which is kind of like a way to harness growth factors without needing to draw your own PRP. Um, and right now there's really a lack of quality studies on what exactly is in different exosomes. How can we best deliver it to the skin? But I think if we could find a way to deliver something to the skin that perhaps was less uncomfortable than using PRP, which has to be injected, I think that that's very exciting. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's the thing. Well, I'm actually very much into longevity, what I call longevity beauty. And I'm working on a novel molecule for skin and for hair. So I'm hoping to, in the next few years, have a new prescription medicine for hair regrowth. So it's something that wow. I think many people are working on. And 
the idea of regenerative medicine, helping hair regrow, regenerate, looking at the follicle. I mean, just when we started doing hair transplants, it was so interesting just to learn that when you take a hair from one place and you put it someplace else where you've lost hair, it behaves like the hair where you took it from, not where you place it. Yeah. So all of the pathways we're learning around hair growth and hair loss and hair cycling, even from the alopecia areata patients and the medicines, is really teaching us about hair cycling. And we're tapping into that and coming up with molecules and products and treatments that are going to help the hair cycle normally and regenerate lost cycles. Where you have hair that's scarred, if you look around it, I don't know if you guys have done this, but when you treat an area that you think is scarred, you notice that you still get some hair growth. So the follicle that's scarred is now surrounded by what I think of as contagious aging or contagious scarring, where they're not scarred, they're just stunned. And if you can lower the inflammation, you actually do get some hair to grow. So I never give up on a scalp or hair. And I think there's so many exciting things coming. Absolutely. And methods that are less painful too, like there's a lot of progression in transepidermal delivery of agents that are different than needles because PRP can be uncomfortable. Um, some of the procedures that we do that are effective are not necessarily the most patient comfort or pain-free so, uh, oriented. So I think that things like ultrasound and some methods that are coming out and some good data are, uh, are we're seeing now is, is exciting. Wonderful. So we have a lot of great solutions now and a lot on the horizon. And I want to thank you all for coming today to the New Beauty booth and sharing this information with us. We know you're all experts in the field and we're super excited to share this information with our followers. Thank you, everyone.